may be seated. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. Yeah, no, never. You know, I thought I'd just have me a little church. I don't know what he brought you out of, but I know what he brought me out of. And he did a good job. You know, whenever we have communion, that's a time just to kind of refresh and think about again. Although it's been almost 40 years, I've not forgotten what he has done for me. You know, and I was just thinking as we were doing communion, we had the bread. Made me think about the bread. I had communion at our church once and we decided we're going to we're going to spruce it up so I got some real nice crackers. But I found out the members start saying, Pastor, if we're going to use those crackers, we're going to need some salami, <laughs> cold cuts, and cheese to go with that. So I thought we better go back to what we just had today because it don't make you think about salami. But it make you think about the blood of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Amen? God bless you. So good to be here one more time at the Living World Conference. I Amen. give honor to God. God give honor to Bishop Leon Martin. I've been knowing him for a number of years. And uh, he's always been who he always is. And we want to give honor to all the pastors that are here. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. I was just thinking about Pastor Kalinda. She must have, she must have been a big tipper. <laughs> Something. So everybody was happy to see her. You've been here all week, and you have been looking at the same theme and the same scripture. So let me help you. I'm going to close out with the summary. And this is not going to be that long. So I'm going to tell you, so stay awake. Stay awake. Don't go to sleep now. If I see Amen. you sleeping, I'm going to point you out. Uh -oh. I'm going to say, well, somebody just hunched that brother over there. The one right there, I'm going to point you out. So hit him. He's, uh, he's got his head down. He's not reading. But if you say amen real loud, I promise not to be long. But I want to talk to you, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, then I'm going to talk about it. We're talking about discovering the key to victorious living. And I was thinking about that. And I think I was also thinking about how we do with conferences and sermons and messages and all of that. And we have some nice titles, some nice themes. But I start thinking about what is victorious living? What is that? What does that look like? Uh, because as a pastor, I'm also observant. And 
the members of the church that I attend seem to have as many issues as folks that don't go to church. Uh, that's at the church I go to. So if you're here this morning and you haven't gotten over your hurts and you're still dealing with your habits, you still got hang-ups and you're still looking for a hookup, I got something to tell you this morning. Now, if that's not you, you can relax a little bit, but, but most of us have hurts and habits and hang-ups, and some are looking for the hookup at our church. But I'm going to talk about victorious living. So what does that look like? That looks like no matter what's going on in your life, you still have the joy of the Lord. That looks like when you wake up in the morning, you say, this is the day the Lord has made. And no matter who you're talking to, you say, I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. You know, you're saying, I know where I'm going. I'm, I know what my life is all about. I, I have a vibrant, I have a, I have a life that is, is vibrant, and it is the abundant life. That's the victorious life. It is discouraging and disheartening when I look at grumpy, complaining, <laughs> defeated, downtrodden believers, and they're that way most of the time. What is wrong with your walk after you done had a, a, a fresh anointing and, and you got a new season? And it, have, have you been waiting on your new season and found out you still got the long, hot summer? And you got a new anointing, but nothing happened? You've been waiting on your breakthrough and you done broke through? Come on, let's be real, because we, you know, we've done a disservice to the church telling you you're going to have all of this and you don't get that, and you act like, uh, you know, you just act like, well, maybe, maybe somebody else is getting it, but not me. Maybe somebody else is being blessed, but it hasn't been me. Maybe somebody else have the joy, but I, I don't have that joy. Maybe somebody else has got a new, fresh anointing, but it's not been me. I've been waiting on mine since 1979. Come on, this should be the greatest hour of the church in this day, in this hour of darkness. We ought to be vibrant, we ought to be alive, and people ought to be running to us and looking at us and saying, I want what you got. But nobody wants what we have. Because we have it only between 11 and 12.30 on Sunday. And when we go home, nobody know we've been to church. I wasn't going to say that. I was going to be nice. But I believe I got somebody's attention. Yes, sir. We just got through singing, God is my everything. But when we leave here, we act like he's our nothing. Hmm. Okay. When Jesus Christ came, he came to give us life and life more abundantly. He didn't come and say what kind of car he going to bless you with. Yes, sir. How much money you going to have and all of that. But while I have the abundant life, I got a nice car. And I got some money. But that's not what he came to give me. He came to give me an abundant life. I enjoy my cars. My old car is a the 2006, my new car is a 2010. <laughs> but I ain't paid a car note since 2010. There you go, man. Yeah. Amen. 
I got some money. Hallelujah. I'm living the abundant life. Every day is a good day. Every day is a day of joy. Every day I can say, thank you, Lord, for a brand new day. See, the abundant life is the victorious life. The abundant life is a joyful life. The abundant life is a fruitful life. The abundant life is a righteous life. And when you leave today, I want to give you a couple of things, and I'm going to tell you how you're going to know whether or not you've applied these keys. Because if nobody ever say to you, you know, you look so joyous and so happy. You seem to have so much peace in the middle of everything that's going on. Tell me what's going on. What do you have that I don't have? If nobody's ever said that to you, you need to start over. It doesn't do us any good just to come to church and have a good time here and then we get out in the world. I said to the men this morning, if we are the light of the world, why is it so dark out there? There are many believers who deep inside feel like they are ineffective and unproductive when it comes to living the victorious godly life. Now, if the truth be known, there, there, there are someone sitting right here right now saying, I don't like the way my life is going. I don't, I don't feel, I'm, I'm worried, I'm anxious. I have, don't have any hope. You know, there's somebody, we sit in the church and we just play, we just play like we're doing all right. Come on, how you doing, sister? Well, I'm too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> and then you see him out in the parking lot just crying and complaining. Listen, this is not the time to play church. This is not the time to play like things are going all right. This is, I, I, I don't care if you, you know, that, that you come here and you're going to raise your hand and shout all up and down the aisle and all of that. Don't, don't bother me. I don't care nothing about that. How are you going to function when you got some issues? That feeling of inadequacy in believers in terms of our ability to live, to live a holy, righteous life. It's not new. It's not unique. It's always happened since the beginning of Christianity. There are those who by their own struggles are aware of the difficulties and challenges of living a godly, holy life. I used to think it was so hard to live holy. It's not hard to live holy. It's hard to try to live holy and live like the devil at the same time. It ain't hard to live holy. Just live holy. <laughs> Just obey God. <laughs> that ain't hard. I mean, you have your challenges in overcoming yourself, but that's you. Can't nobody stop you from living holy. Now, there are times we are constrained by a religious system and false doctrine. And people telling us stuff that we need to do and, and we can do and we can't do and all of that. You know, when we came up in church, they told the women they couldn't wear makeup. Couldn't wear pants. That wasn't in the Bible, but they, it was making it. You're going to be holy, you can't wear pants. Can't wear no makeup. Aren't you glad you don't live back there? Because you wouldn't be able to wear that hair. I ain't got too much more time. Well, you know, today everybody got good hair. When I was a kid, we used to say, well, he got some good hair. Well, I found out right now, any kind of hair is good hair. Is that right, Bishop? Here's what Peter told us in 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant of an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those 
or in the King James, to them, to those through who the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let me just tell you a couple of things. Peter introduced himself and emphasized that he was a servant that was sold out to God. Now, if you're going to have the abundant life, one of the keys is whether or not you're going to be sold out. And then he said he's also an apostle who's been assigned by God. So let me set the table for this message so you can decide whether you want to listen real close or not. He said, to those, and I stopped right there. I said, who are the those? He says, I ain't talking to everybody. I'm talking to those, or in the King James, to them. Who are the them and the those? These are those who have committed to Christ, who are saved. And like I said this morning, who are show sure enough saved. So if you're not saved, you have an a excuse today. You're excused from this message. You don't even have to listen. You can, you can look on your phone and do all kind of stuff if you're not saved because this ain't for you. So you're not going to be able to do what I'm going to tell you you need to do. You're not going to be able to operate these keys I'm going to give you if you're not saved. But to those, now you want to look at somebody and say, are you one of those? I'm going to look at him and say, are you one of those? Or if you're from the hood, say, you one of them? Because <laughs> it's to those. And we got to understand, there's a difference between those and the one who ain't those. There's a difference between the saved and unsaved. There's a difference between the holy and the unholy. We forgot to draw the line here lately in this culture. Every, everybody thinks they saved. Yeah. Are you saved? Yes, I'm saved and I'm holy. People have figured out how to have church. They go practice shouting. And they can shout better than you. And then cuss you out while they shouting. But the old saints used to say, everybody talking about heaven. They ain't going. See, there are those who receive their salvation by faith, and there are others who receive their salvation by fraud. Come on, you got it, you got it, you got it. Come on, just say you say, you said it, you got it. Until you start living saved, you ain't got it. You can say it all you want to, but Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and you haven't done anything I told you to do? Uh -huh. In fact, he said, I never knew you. Amen. But then Peter says in, chapter, in verse 3, he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Let me stop right there. His divine power. Say his power. I'll talk about three things in the next few minutes I'm done. His power, his promises, and then our participation. Now, Peter was the first thing that said, God is my everything. Now, look at that. Now, I want you to get this. He said, his divine power, his divine power, has given us everything we need. Now, if you're saved, when you got saved, he hooked you up with everything you need. Now, the problem is we don't even know what he gave us because we haven't dug into the treasure chest of all that he gave us. But you say, I gave you everything. I don't know why you keep coming to me asking for this and asking for that. I already gave it to you. So walk in it. 
And when you know that you have something, you can function in it. When you have authority, I see this at the church. Sometimes I, we, we give someone a, an assignment and we give them the authority and they won't walk in. They keep saying, well, well, pastor, what do you want me to do? Pastor, you want me to do it? Can I do this? Can I move the chairs over there? I'm thinking, you, you know, I gave you authority. See, I, I understand authority. When they give me an assignment, I'm going to walk in the assignment. You don't have to tell me nothing else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all of my authority. I was at a church before I started pastoring, and the pastor asked me to run the television ministry. He said, would you operate that? I said, so you want me to do everything, run the whole ministry from the beginning to the end, get it on TV? He said, yes. And so I started doing that. I never asked him any more questions. But he had a guy that was a member for a long time. He kept on, he was in the booth, kept saying, the bishop don't want it this way. The bishop don't like this. The bishop don't want that. And I turned around and said, will you shut up? I said, the bishop know where I am. He gave me the authority to run this. If he don't like it, he'd come tell me. Now, get out of my ear or get out of this place. So when God gives me something, I operate in that. You don't have to keep praying for the stuff he already gave you. He said, I have given you everything you need. Now, I want you to, if you don't get anything else, say, God's already gave me everything I need. I just need to figure out where it's at. It's here somewhere. It's here somewhere. It's here somewhere. I'm, I've been overlooking it. I've been missing it. But God, you gave me some peace already. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. He said, I gave you some peace already. Walk in the peace of God. The joy of the Lord is already your strength. He has given us everything we need and he has given it to us by his divine power. In other words, he, with his power, he employed it and put it in you because he knew that you don't have the strength sometimes to understand what's in there and you wouldn't have received it if you had to come ask for it. He said, with my power, I just slapped it on you. My divine power has given you everything you need pertaining to life. What's life? I need to ask him for his wisdom. God, you give me the wisdom for every decision you make. You said in all your ways, acknowledge the Lord and he will direct your path. So we got the scripture. We have the word of God. Everything is in there. We need to start operating by it. Yeah. My son was talking to me. He said, Dad, I'm thinking about uh, moving to New York and, and uh, just working there and doing this and that. What do you think? I said, in all of your ways, acknowledge the Lord and he will direct your path. What else you got? I mean, he, that's what the word of God says. You know God, acknowledge him. If the Lord, go, if the Lord gives you the, uh, the peace to go there, go there. If not, don't go. What do you think about this job? Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and he will direct your path. That's what he, I mean, how simple can that be? He, he gave us that. But we go, Lord, I don't know, Lord, I don't know. Lord, show me a sign. Lord, send me a word. Lord, you call five or six people. Get all confused. The Lord said, talk to me, I'll tell you. I've given you everything you need. Now, what you know what that means in the Greek? Everything. <laughs> It means everything in the Greek. Give you everything you need pertaining to life and godliness. Here's the other thing he said he gave us. His great and precious promise. Uh -huh. Now I got everything he needs and he gave us some promise. That, that, that's why the bishop was talking about tithing. God promised to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. You don't have room enough to receive. But 70% of the members don't believe that. They say they do, but they don't because they don't die. You know, the only reason a, 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 one of those 
don't tithe is because you really don't believe in what God said he's going to do, he's going to do it. You don't believe it, otherwise you do it. So I grabbed a hold of that. I mean, now I, when I got saved, I'm thinking, this is what God says in his word. I wasn't a giver and a tither before I got saved. I wasn't one that just liked to give money to the church. I, I was a taker. I wasn't a giver. But I read the word. He said he's going to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. I won't have room enough to feed. That sounds pretty good to me. Let me go in my pocket and start tithing. And I've been tithing since August of 1983, and I have not stopped. And God has opened the windows of heaven and poured out blessings. We don't have room enough to receive. I opened up our freezer the other day. I wanted to put a soda in there so we can get cold real quick. It wouldn't even fit. Got so much stuff in it. Got to go to the other. Now we got two freezers. I opened that door. Stuff is falling out. I talked to the wife. Man, we got to get rid of some of this stuff. She said, we need a bigger freezer. No, we don't. We need to get rid of some of this. Why? We, have room, we don't have room enough to receive it. God has blessed us and blessed us and blessed us because we just participated yeah. with what he's already given us. His word is true, it's clear, and it's not rocket science. All you got to do is walk in what God has done. God has given us his great and precious promises. He promised that we're going to make it. He promised that he'll walk through the valley with us. He promised that he'll, he'll, he'll make a way for us. He promised that he can heal us. He promised that he'll do great and mighty things in our life. He promised that he will use us. He promised us that he's able to do more than we can ask or think or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. But we're not employing and participating with him. God is saying, if you're not living this victorious life, it's not on me. God says, it's not on me. I gave you everything you need, and I gave you a bunch of promises. You are not participating. You're spectating. You're looking at the promises, but you're not using the promises. You're looking at this, but you're not doing it. You're not obeying. You're not obeying. You're not walking in it. You're not grabbing a hold to it. The key is... Why should you have a key if you're not going to use it? They give you a key to a, 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 a Bentley. And you're walking around with the key, but you're not going to ever use the car. Listen, whatever I got a key to it, I'm going to find out what that key opens, and I'm going to look in there. Because it's locked for a reason. Everybody can't use this. Unbelievers can't walk in this. Folks ought to be looking at you and saying you're blessed. I was just looking at Malachi. He said, the nations will observe you and they will call you blessed. Other folks will look at you and say, you are so blessed. Oh, you have so much joy. You have so much strength. God didn't intend for believers to walk around uh, and, 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 and not be vibrant and not be... Other folks ought to be envious. Look at the Israelites when they were going through. Everybody was saying... Something, something's different about those folks. They are blessed. Their God is, is war, go to war for them. He fight their battles, and they got all kind of blessings. I don't know what they're doing, but, but uh, they are different. They ought to be saying that about us. We don't just come here to hear these words and then go home and say, well, that was really good. That showed they blessed my soul. That showed they blessed my soul. I, I, that show was good. No, you need... Uh, then you, you're struggling with all kind of things. If you're struggling right now, say, God, you got a way out of this. Uh, help me to take another step. Help me to employ this key. You said you've given me everything that I need for, pertaining to life and godliness. If I, can't find, if I don't see it, show it to me. Where is it at? What do I need to do? What do I need to change? What, are, what do I need to stop doing? This week, say, things are going to get better for me. Things are going to get better for me. I'm going to stop complaining about it. I'm going to start praising God. I'm going to start praising God. Let me watch my mouth. Let me watch what I'm saying. I'm going to start praising you. I'm going to start blessing you. I'm going to start looking for the blessing. I'm going to start looking for a better life. I'm going to start looking for something that's going to be different. I'm going to do that. Nobody else can do that for you. I'm going to do that. Are you sick? Say, Lord, I'm sick. But every day I'm feeling better. I'm, I can do a little something with where I'm at. 
I don't feel good, but I'm going to pick up the phone and call somebody else and give them a word of encouragement. The bishop talked about this yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm just about finished. I'm, I don't have anything else to say. I'm, he's given us everything we need, and he wants us to. Uh, I, oh, let me read this. He said, "I want you to participate." Through these, he's given us his great and and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. He says, uh, if you keep on listening to all that stuff you're listening to online and, and in your ears and all these rap music and all this stuff on Facebook everybody else is saying, you're going to be corrupted in this world by your evil desires because you still got a taste for some of that stuff. Yeah, I'll save you, but you still got a taste off in there somewhere. You know how it is when you have to get on a diet and you can't, you can't eat that cheesecake no more and that, uh, you, can't, you can't eat that, uh, you can't eat that uh, peach cobbler no more, but you smell one coming out the oven. You would say, well, the Lord knows. So you keep on listening to some of this stuff these other folks got and, and hearing that and looking at this stuff on TV and that stuff, these evil desires. He said you will be able to escape it if you are participating in the divine nature. Say, Lord, I'm walking with you. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. We don't, we don't say that no more. We don't want them to walk with us. But we got a little run to make. I got a little stop I need to make. I don't need you. Don't, don't walk with me now, Lord. Don't walk with me now. No, no, no. We used to sing that. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. While I'm on this. No, we don't, we don't, we don't want to walk with him. Then meet me in the glory land, Lord. Meet me in the glory land. And then he finishes this passage by saying, here's what you do, and this is where you practice in verses 5 through 9. For this reason, that you want to participate in this divine nature, make every effort, this is where you're participating, make every effort to add to your faith some goodness and add to your goodness some knowledge. Now, you've you got some work to do. You add to your faith self-control and add to your knowledge some self-control and your self-control some perseverance and some perseverance godliness and to God and his brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness love but if you possess these qualities in increasing measures they're going to keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you want to be productive and effective? How many of you want to be successful in the kingdom? Amen. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand on your feet right now. We're just going to take a minute and say, Lord, I, I want to be victorious day by day. I want to start today. I want to start. I want to change the atmosphere. You can change the atmosphere in which you function and you operate. It's a, where, where's your mind? Where's your thoughts? I want to change the atmosphere. I'm going to do that by understanding that God has already given me everything. I haven't used it. I, I don't have the knowledge of it, but he's already given it to me. And he's given me some promises. God, I want to know you. I want to operate according to your promises. And Lord, I want to participate. So I'll have the, I'll have the power of God by your divine power. I have your promises. Now I'm going to participate. Somebody say, I'm going to participate. I'm going to make every effort to walk in victory that God provides. Father, I thank you today 
We thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for your divine power. We thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost that come to live on the inside of us, to lead us and to guide us and give us your wisdom. Help us, almighty God, to acknowledge you in all of our ways that you will direct our path. We thank you, almighty God, that we're not leaning on our own understanding, but we're asking you right now to help us to take the keys that you have given us that we can live a victorious, vibrant, abundant life day by day. Not going to walk in fear, we're not going to walk in worry and in anxiety and defeat and ungodliness, but we're going to walk in righteousness, holiness, sanctification, and joy. We thank you for it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you.